In recognition of Asian and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, we'll be featuring APANO. APANO is a statewide grassroots organization uniting Asians and Pacific Islanders to achieve social justice. Today, we'll be learning about how we can stand in solidarity against Asian hate and support our neighbors and our community. With us today is the Associate Director of APANO, Duncan Huang. Welcome, Duncan. It's good to have you here. Great. Yeah, thanks for having me. You're welcome. So you've had a very busy year at APANO. Um, since this is Asian and Pacific American Heritage Month, we thought we'd check in with you and kind of find out what's, what's on the forefront of your work this month or the month of May. What do you have going on? Um, well, I think over the last year, we've really been focusing on kind of two kind of big crises or um, I guess different types of pandemics. You know, I think we're working mm -hmm. on, of course, the, the COVID-19 pandemic and making sure our communities know like all that public health information they need. And over the last couple of months, really, you know, finding out about kind of the different vaccine opportunities that exist. Yeah. And then uh, really been shifting over to kind of the economic recovery. Um, you know, our communities were devastated about, I think, 26 percent of Asian American owned businesses nationwide um, closed due to the pandemic. Um, so I think that includes a lot of, you know, how do we get businesses back open? How do we get folks back to work? Um, so I think there's all that. And then over the last month, there's also been a pretty uh, pronounced spike in hate and bias crimes or incidents against our community as well. Um, probably, you know, due to the last couple of years and the narrative around the China virus or Wu flu and, and things like that. Yeah. So just responding to those kind of trio of, of uh, public health and um, I guess social justice yeah. uh, crises. Well, those are really big issues. I mean, they, those are the two biggest issues for every American, I think, this last year. But Absolutely. if you're one of the groups that have been, you know, personally affected, that's a much bigger thing. Um, so tell, let me start with the COVID uh, issue. How has Apano been able to help their, their people? I mean, you, you said you've like helping find vaccines. I mean, um, do you find your community as a whole, is it receptive to taking the vaccine? Kind of early on last year, we adapted a lot of our programming. Um, so it shifted a lot to first kind of meeting some basic needs. Uh -huh. um, so we are doing like rental assistance. Uh, we have a food security program. Um, and we're doing small business technical assistance and grants and things like that. Um, so I think those are very kind of like, you know, um, direct forms of assistance. Right, and we're right. also working on kind of a systemic level to make sure, um, you know, that public health officials are, are carefully considering kind of the needs in our community. You know, for example, Pacific Islander communities have COVID infection rates that were 12 times higher than in white communities. Um, it's huge. That's huge. It is absolutely, yeah. So I think you know, there's just kind of really kind of specific needs that that need to be addressed. Yeah, yeah. That's that's a big undertaking, um, and I know lots of nonprofits have had to really switch and try to uh, accommodate, you know, the needs of their of you know the people they're serving um, in different ways. So that's, uh, but, but I know that you've kept very busy and have been really doing a good job from what I hear. I, you know, Thank I hear you. nothing but good, good things about Apano. Okay, um, that's very generous. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, well, you're welcome. It's, it's true. Um, then the other issue that you talked about was the, um, was the Asian hate crimes and the, and, you know, the proliferation of that. It's really, it's a shocking, but it's, it's what's happening. Um, and I've, I read a lot of stuff on your website. Um, there was a great, blog i can't remember if it was yours or if it was a, uh, a director but it was really good about about how you know how to deal with that i'm wondering how um how you think the white community or just anybody in the community can better support uh the the asian community and the pacific islanders how what what do, is there anything you can think of that would be a good practice or a good uh, route to take to in order to support your community Sure. Well, I think, you know, one of the first things is just, you know, getting educated on kind of like the historical legacy of racism against Asian Pacific Islanders. I think whenever, you know, folks in the United States kind of like come upon uh, difficult times, you know, we often seen, see a backlash, you know, against our community. Mm -hmm. So whether it was, 
you know, during World War II with a Japanese internment or in the 80s where, you know, folks maybe thought that Japanese automakers were overtaking American automakers to, to 9-11 um, and then like the Muslim ban. So I think that that cycle of um, backlash has really kind of been present throughout, you know, our history and in Oregon in specific. And I just learned that the Oregon Constitution or originally had provisions against Chinese folks that, you know, live in Oregon. So they had to pay $50 a year to the government. They couldn't vote. Just... They, could, they couldn't own property and they couldn't do mining. And, you know, a lot of uh, the Chinese that moved here kind of in the 1800s were working on the railroad or in, in mines. Right. So even um... in Oregon, you know, that history has kind of been, been baked in. Um, so, you know, I think what we're working on is really kind of like systemically, like how, how do we address that? And, you know, make sure Oregon is a, is a, you know, welcoming and inclusive place for all. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's shocking when you hear those things. It's like with the, you know, the Black community, how, you know, so much we've learned in the last year that most of us or a lot of us didn't know about the history of our state and how we, how we treated the Black community. And, and then finding out it, it's not just them. <laughs> it's Absolutely. not just them. Um, yes. Uh, how, what, what is the relationship between um, the Asian community and the Black community? Is, is there's uh, some solidarity there? Um, or, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, that that is what we strive towards. You know, I think, you know, what we're all working towards is, you know, how do we address white supremacy and mm-hmm. the way it's kind of played out through our, our histories? So like an example of like our approach now to, to Asian hate crimes, like, now, first say like last year, what the Department of Justice here in Oregon, they tracked 500 incidents of hate against um, black folks and 100 against Asian Americans. Mm-hmm. So it's really been a spike this year. Yeah. And, you know, we're just talking about this issue because it's relatively new mm-hmm. for Asian Americans. Um, but, you know, for like black communities, that happens you know, much more regularly and much yeah. more consistently. Um, so our policy response is really kind of, you know, focused on addressing hate and, um, you know, not, not from just an Asian American pers- perspective, but, you know, how do we, how do we, you know, include all communities in that response right, as well? Right. Um, so one example is like, you know, I don't believe we're going to be able to enforce our way out of hate crimes. Like, I don't think people no. that perpetrate that are like, oh, I, I might get extra jail time if I commit a hate crime. That doesn't right. really um, prevent future hate crimes, does it? Right, right. So, you know, I, I don't think that, you know, having a substantial police presence that you know, other communities might feel differently about, right? Like, you know, we just had the verdict that came out last week. And, you know, we all know that, you know, the Black experience with police is much different. Um, mm-hmm. So we're not supporting, like, you know, a, a bunch more police. We're really looking for ways to, like, invest in the community so that the community can can um, you know have safe places to live and jobs and you know safe transportation and I think that's yeah. really what what leads to a, a better sense of safety in community. Yeah. yeah, not feeling safe in your own community is is a darn shame. That's <laughs> what it is. Absolutely. You know, yes. <laughs> it's just it's just not the way it should be. Your home should be your home. Um, well, so let me backtrack a little bit to what we were talking about before you talked a little bit about the history about what white community can do oh sorry yeah yes. no that was that was me so go ahead um yeah that's why you know i think first it's just like you know encouraging um folks to, to learn more about the history and we're also looking for uh, people that are interested to take this training um and it's um on a website called ihollaback.org um it's a bystander training so it'll like talk up through kind of like the the steps and considerations for when you see incidents of hate and bias, like how do you interrupt it and how do you do to, to support that person that's experiencing that. Um, so yeah, I think that's yeah, something that, you know, all, you know, kind of white folks that are, you know, interested in racial justice can do is like, how do you, you know, stand up for against these incidents? I think that's the main thing that white people that I've talked to have, have in common is that even though we, perhaps never felt like we were racist, there were times we didn't stand up when we should have. And I think that's, um, that's been the hardest thing, I think, for a lot of people is just, you know, to be able to do it and feel safe doing it. And sometimes you're not going to feel safe doing it, but it's the right thing to do. Um, 
Yeah, that, so we can find that information on the website about that that training. You do a lot of policy work, don't you? A lot of advocacy work and, and yeah, uh, that's, policy. Yeah, that's a major portion of our work. Yes. Yeah, it is, it is. So what, what is what is out there right now that you're working on currently as far um, as policy work? Well, you know, I think we're we're thankful to the federal delegation for for having the COVID hate crimes bill pass, you know, in, in Congress. Yeah. Um, so it got you know strong bipartisan support. You know, yeah, it, that, surprisingly strong. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. There's one one no vote right. in, in right. who that is. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know, I think the statewide level, you know, we're working with our statewide delegation to to really kind of invest more in. Um, like a hotline maybe for uh, folks that are experiencing hate and bias incidents. Like right now, you know, you can call the Department of Justice to, to report it. But then I think there is kind of some missing steps where, you know, like you could access additional resources, whether it's like, you know, victim support funds or mental health resources or things like that. Right. Um, and having that maybe not at the, you know, at the government level, but you know, at a community level. Um, something maybe a little less intimidating than calling the federal government. <laughs> exactly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I think, you know, that, that that's a resource we're looking for. And then again, you know, looking for additional investments overall in kind of the Asian Pacific Islander community. You know, we're the, the fastest growing demographic in the state. And, um, you know, I think the, the nonprofit ecosystem hasn't really caught up in terms of the supports that the community needs. Okay. Um, you know, so more investment in affordable housing or economic development, yeah. workforce development. Like those are things that, you know, those are investments that create stronger, more resilient communities. And we really need that here in Oregon. Yeah, yeah, we do. Um, I know you have some really good partners in that. I know you work with the Rosewood Initiative and, and, and others that, um, that are working in the right direction. Um, yeah. You also mentioned that, um, you know, supporting I can't remember how you said that, but the economic development, you, you take a special interest in the J district um, and do a lot of, of work there. Is, would that be a big help for more people to, to support the businesses in the J district? I mean, I no, imagine, absolutely. I imagine yeah. that's an area where, that was probably hit pretty hard. Um, by the, by yeah, the I mean, we've, we've definitely seen, you know, since the beginning of the pandemic, kind of early on, even before kind of a shutdown orders in Oregon, you know, they saw like 30 to 60% decline in business because people were afraid to come out or, you know, um, eat Chinese food basically. Um, oh so God. it's, so it's been, it's been, um, you know, a challenging year. So, you know, I think, you know, take, ordering takeout and, you know, patronizing the businesses, you know, that's, mm -hmm. that'd be, you know, a great thing for folks to do yeah, as well. Yeah. And also extremely delicious. Yes, yes, it is. It is. Yeah, I think that's a that's an it's an easy first step to take, if nothing else. So, um, you're uh, when you're you're working on your policies. Is there um, what what is your your main focus in your policy work? Is it is it is there is there a main focus in your policy work? Um, you know, I think it's it's really kind of meeting the the needs of a community at the moment. Whatever's going um, on then that. Yeah, so I don't think there's a main focus. You know, I think we, we really believe in like um, strategies and approaches and we're not like an issue-based organization. Yeah. I think, you know, we invest deeply in like leadership development, uh, community organizing, advocacy, you know, research. Um, so I think those are kind of like the strategies we use, but we don't really, we're not like, we only do housing or transportation. Or, right, right. It's pretty know. much a holistic approach to, to the community. Right. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So is there anything that you would like us to take away from our conversation with you? Is there anything that you think um, as a community we need to know that we haven't touched on or um, anything you want us to know about Apano? Um, gosh, I think, you know, I would just end by saying that, you know, words really do matter. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think earlier on in, in the pandemic when people were making jokes about, you know, the Wu flu or the Kung flu, yeah, like, you know, that, that wasn't taken as seriously. And we've really seen that, that emboldens and enables, you know, people to, to take action. And, yeah. you know, like we saw in January with uh, the insurrection at the Capitol, you know, That's that sense. like words do matter and they, they can incite people to, to violence and it's happening, you know, in DC and in, in cities across America. So I think, yeah, yeah just- um, yeah, Somebody is going to take that seriously and, and run with it. 
you know. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, words do matter. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Thank you, Duncan. I really appreciate your time and um, I appreciate all the work that, that Apana is doing. So thank you so much for joining us today. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks for having me. You're welcome. And to all of you um, watching out there, please be safe, be healthy, and do what you can to make this a better, healthier, safer, and inclusive community. 